All right, so let's look at Matthew Miller's article, Frost's Broken Roads, a little bit more carefully to get an idea of what we would want to write about if we were going to write a literary analysis. So we're going to do sort of an analysis of Miller's analysis. Um, so first, first things first, in his first paragraph, he is going to give you a type of thesis, and he's going to hook you. How is he going to hook you? So he says, Robert Frost's poem is arguably one of the most popular poems ever written. He's telling you immediately why this is important. And he is also going to give you his foil. That is to say, he's going to give you the person that he's arguing against. He says, it is often interpreted as an ode to individualism. And that's definitely how a lot of people do interpret this poem, right? You yourself might even interpret it this way. Um, the road less traveled is the road of individuality. The road more traveled is the road of conformity, right? Lots of people have done it. You're going to do it too versus not many people are doing this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Um, but that's not what Miller thinks, right? Miller is going to provide his own thesis. He says that instead we have to uncover some inconsistencies in the poem and find, and we'll find that there's actually a more subtle reading of the poem, a more subtle interpretation that we might be missing if we just conclude that it's about um, individuality. So he says, uh, the convenient conclusion ignores several conflicting yet beautiful details that lead the poem down a path of broken metaphor and temporal inconsistency. Okay, so what does that mean? He's saying that the poem, the normal inter interpretation of the poem is a little bit broken because of some features of the poem that he's going to show us. Okay, so what is he going to talk about? So the first, the first paragraph, he mostly talks about temporal inconsistency. What's temporal inconsistency? Well, temporal is just like an ad adjective for time, right? When we talk about um, temporal inconsistency, we're talking about something that's inconsistent about the timing of the poem. And so he talks about all of the evidence in the poem that lead us to think about time. So the yellow wood he considers the yellow wood to be um, symbolic of autumn or descriptive of autumn, right? The leaves are yellow in autumn. Um, but he describes, he describes this as inconsistent with the narrator's voice because the narrator appears to be an older person talking about themselves when they were much younger. So if we're going to be symbolically consistent, it should be a green wood, right? Because, because youth is like springtime um, and springtime is green. So you would think it should be a green wood, but because it's not, we might think that, um, we might think that there's something um, contradictory here in the symbolism, right? Maybe the traveler actually already was reasonably older when they were traveling in the wood. Maybe they're not um, as young as they seem to be. And if they are, what does that mean for the meaning of the poem, right? So in the second paragraph, uh, Miller is elaborating more on this concept more on the concept of temporal inconsistency, going greater into detail about, about autumn versus spring, right? Morning versus night and the symbolism there because symbolism is important to a poem, right? So he is, he is reinforcing this thesis and he's saying that it has this symbolic meaning to the poem. 
Huh, so what does he do in the third paragraph? So he's going to move to, to the concept of identity, the theme of identity. So he's changing topics. He's going from time to identity, and he transitions with this, this transition here. Another question, right? So we know from the beginning of this paragraph he's talking about something else. Another question that complicates a traditional understanding of the poem is that of identity. So the problem here that's being discussed is that when somebody, when, when we're talking about this poem, we're talking about the identity of the narrator. So it's notable, it's notable that the difficulty in the poem is that the traveler as a single person cannot travel both and be one traveler at the same time, right? It's a contradiction to say that I took both paths um, at the same time because one person can't take them both at the same time. You'd have to be two people. Um, so he's pointing out the fact that the poem is about how your choices might lead to your identity. You being one person, you're, this choice is going to lead you to be a particular kind of person, right? Um, and the traveler, it's notable that the traveler actually does make both choices. So the traveler actually goes down one path um, for the first for another day, right? He goes down the first path for another day. Um, but then he turns around knowing how way leads on to way. I doubt it if I should ever come back. So he knows how this choice is going to affect his identity, um, and that's going to lead him to the person that he becomes, right? Um, but Miller sees a problem with this, and he keeps on discussing it in the next paragraph, in the fourth paragraph. Um, the fourth paragraph, he talks about how this problem of identity, um, this problem of identity seems to be complicated by the fact that um, in, at the end of the poem, um, when, we, when we sort of pull back and realize that the narrator is talking about um, the choice they made a long time ago, there's several things that make it seem not nearly as positive as we might initially think. So we might initially think they chose the path, they chose the road less traveled, and it's a positive thing that affected their life in a positive way. But, but Miller is showing that that might not necessarily be the case. He shows us that we have this M dash, which is this particular type of punctuation point, this dash, right? It's a long dash. And it sort of indicates that the person is pausing um, as if they're lost in thought, maybe. And Miller interprets this almost like a stutter, like the person who, the narrator, um, is so emotional that they're actually, they actually have to pause here. And he thinks that this could show regret or lack of confidence in the choice, rather than, rather than being a positive thing, it could be a negative thing that he chose the, the road less traveled. Um, and what else, what else? So Miller points out that the final phrase, the final phrase made all the difference. We might interpret that positively, right? It made all the difference that I chose that path. Um, you know, I, I went to the doctor and got the medicine and the medicine made all the difference. Um, so that choice to do that thing affected you positively. But Miller points out that made all the difference is ambiguous. Made all the difference could be interpreted positively or negatively. It's neutral, right? Um, you can also say, I went to the doctor and didn't take the medicine, or I didn't go to the doctor and didn't take the medicine, and that made all the difference. Um, you might be saying that, you might be saying that, uh, that affected you negatively, right? You might be saying, um, that, that the difference was negative. 
Um, so there's some, some room to interpret the poem negatively or, or you could just interpret it neutrally. It made all the difference, but the difference was neutral, like that, that the difference could go both ways. Our choices can be good, our choices can also be bad. So Miller's showing, showing that for, by using that phrase difference, Frost is deliberately, deliberately leaving it open-ended. Not, he's not coming down on positive or negative entirely, um, and he may even be citing negative if we, if we take this M dash, if we take the interpretation of the M dash seriously as, as showing regret, right? So what else does uh, Miller do? So in the third and uh, fourth paragraph and fifth, or not, not third, fourth, and fifth, but in the next three paragraphs, um, we talk about the idea that this might actually be an autobiographical poem. So um, it might be, it might have been written as a joke for a friend. Um, so there's this, there's this evidence um, from Frost's autobiography, um, or not his autobiography, right? But Robinson, Catherine Robinson's interpretation of Frost's correspondence. Um, there's this, this idea that um, Frost would go on walks with his friend and um, his friend Thomas, and Thomas would always regret not going down the other road when they went on these walks together. And Frost would say, you know, no matter which road you take, you'll always sigh and wish you'd taken another. So Thomas or Thomas is regretful. Thomas could be seen as the traveler in the poem, uh, regretfully sighing that he didn't take the other road. Um, and this reinforces the, the point above, which is that um, the traveler might be regretful about not taking the other road. So, if the traveler is regretful, or I mean, if this supports that interpretation, then it's just one more reason to believe that the poem might actually be negative instead of positive. And because it's negative instead of positive, then we don't think anymore, we don't want to uh, anymore reinforce the original idea that this is a poem about individuality, um, because the poem might actually be treating the topic um, with some ambiguity or or maybe even with some negativity. All right. And then in the final in the final uh, paragraph, we conclude um, with Miller wrapping up and reinforcing his original thesis, which is that although we typically may read it as a uh, an ode to individualism on closer inspection, it's not as clear, right? It is much less clear of a poem than we might be led to believe um, when we just read it real quickly. So that sort of shows you how, how Miller is looking at the poem and using all those details, right? All of those quotations. And he's using those quotations to make a particular interpretation, a particular analysis of the poem. So when we write our analysis essays, whether our analysis essay is on something specific, like, like a poem, or is on a more general topic, we can think about it in terms of this, right? There's something that we're analyzing. We're thinking about the thing being analyzed, um, whether we're doing a movie review treating the movie as something to be analyzed. Um, I liked the movie because of these reasons, and we cite those specific details. I didn't like the movie for these reasons, and you sp cite those specific details. Um, Miller is kind of showing you how to do that on a poem that, um, on, a, on a famous poem, and we can do that right on, on anything, right? We could do that on our, a text message to our friends, um, or, or from our friends, we could do that on 
um, a a political speech, we could do that, yeah, on your favorite movie. Um, I know that many of us um, probably have conversations um, with our friends, perhaps, about our favorite movie and why we liked it and why we didn't. So we already do what Miller is doing just in a less rigorous way, right? We're doing it, uh, we're doing it unconsciously, um, not even thinking about the fact that we're doing it. Um, and even we, we even do it about things um, simpler than that, right? Our friend might have sent us a text message and we might read the text message and interpret it a certain way. Or even we sent our friend a text message and they were silent. And we interpret their silence a specific way. We say, well, wait, their silence is evidence of them ignoring us, maybe. And we cite the fact that um, usually they respond, but this time they're not. So maybe I said something they didn't like and now they're ignoring me, right? That's an analysis similar to what Miller is doing. Um, we are doing that already when we interpret a text message in that way. We do it with the movies. We do it with politics for those of us who are into politics. Um, we do it really with anything that we want to, we want to think about, right, in detail. 